Heaven, a word that stirs the imagination and ignites the soul. But what if heaven is more than what you've been told? What if it's not just a distant dream, but a real breathtaking place prepared just for you? A place where there's no more pain, no more darkness and no more sorrow. A place where the glory of God fills every corner and where His light shines forever. In today's video, we're diving deep into the truth about heaven according to the Bible. Together, we'll uncover what the Apostle John saw in his vision. Truths that reveal a heaven far more glorious and real than you might have ever imagined. We'll explore the promise of a new heaven and a new earth, the dwelling place of God among His people, and the eternal life that flows from the river of life. And most importantly, we'll uncover how you can accept God's invitation to be part of this incredible place. If you've ever wondered what heaven is truly like, or if you've questioned what awaits you beyond this life, then this is the video for you. So, stay with us until the end, because what you discover today could change the way you think about eternity. But before we begin, if you're new to our channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss out on our future content. And if you find this video inspiring, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others who need to hear this message. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave a comment below and let's start a conversation. Together, we can spread the truth of God's Word and inspire others to seek the eternal hope that's found in Him now. Let's explore the incredible truths about heaven, truths that could transform your understanding of where you will spend eternity. Number 1. A New Heaven and a New Earth Let's start with a powerful vision from the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, where he writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. John's vision marks a profound transformation, a renewal of all creation. The term new in this context doesn't just mean brand new, but rather a renewal or restoration of what was originally intended. The new heaven and new earth signify the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan, where the old, corrupted world marred by sin, suffering and death is replaced by a renewed existence that reflects God's perfect will. This isn't merely a spiritual concept, but a tangible reality. The idea of a new earth speaks to the physical restoration of our world, where the separation between heaven and earth no longer exists. In this new creation, heaven and earth converge, and God's presence fills all in all. John's vision echoes the prophetic words found in Isaiah, chapter 65, verse 17, where God declares, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. This promise of a new creation has been a thread throughout Scripture, pointing to a future where the consequences of sin are completely undone, and all things are made new. Furthermore, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 reinforces this hope, stating, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. The new heaven and new earth will be a place of righteousness, where justice, peace, and the presence of God will reign eternally. John also mentions that there was no longer any sea. In biblical symbolism, the sea often represents chaos, danger, and separation. By stating that there will be no sea in the new creation, John is emphasizing the removal of all that brings fear, chaos, and separation from God. It's a return to the perfect order and peace that existed before the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. This vision of a new heaven and a new earth invites us to imagine a future where all the brokenness of our current world is healed. It's a world where the physical and the spiritual are harmoniously united where God's presence is not confined to a distant heaven, but is intimately intertwined with our renewed physical existence. Number 2. A place without sorrow or pain. One of the most comforting aspects of heaven is found in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This verse offers a glimpse into the profound hope that awaits believers, a promise of complete restoration and healing. In heaven, God himself will tenderly wipe away every tear, 
signifying not just the end of sorrow, but the personal care and compassion of our Creator. This intimate act of God wiping away tears speaks to the depth of His love and the comfort He provides to His children. The eradication of death, mourning, crying and pain marks the end of the old order of things, the fallen state of the world marred by sin and its consequences. This old order has been the source of all human suffering since the fall of Adam and Eve, as described in Genesis chapter 3 verses 16 to 19, where pain, toil and death entered the human experience as a result of sin. But in heaven, this curse is completely reversed. The promise of a life free from pain and sorrow is echoed throughout Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 25 verse 8, the prophet foretells a time when he will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove His people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. This prophecy aligns with John's vision in Revelation, confirming that God's ultimate plan is to abolish death and all its associated sorrows. Similarly, in Isaiah chapter 35 verse 10 we read, And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This verse beautifully depicts the joy and gladness that will characterize the lives of those who enter heaven. Sorrow and sighing, expressions of the pain and grief of this world, will be forever banished. Heaven, therefore, is not just a place of eternal existence. It's a place of eternal joy and peace, where the troubles and trials of this world are completely forgotten. Jesus himself promised this to his followers, saying in John chapter 16 verse 22, So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. This joy, which no one can take away, finds its ultimate fulfillment in heaven. The Apostle Paul also offers encouragement regarding the trials we face in this life, writing in Romans chapter 8 verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. This glory refers to the future reality of heaven, where the weight of our current sufferings will pale in comparison to the overwhelming joy and peace we will experience in God's presence. Furthermore, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17, Paul reassures believers, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. The eternal glory that Paul speaks of is the very essence of heaven, an existence where pain and suffering are no more, replaced by the boundless glory of being with God. In heaven, the promise of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 4, will be fully realized. It will be a place where the brokenness of this world is healed, where God's people will live in perfect harmony with Him and with one another. No more death means no more separation from loved ones. No more mourning means no more grief over loss. No more crying means no more tears of sorrow. And no more pain means no more physical or emotional suffering. Imagine an existence where every burden is lifted, every wound is healed, and every heartache is soothed. This is the reality that awaits us in heaven, a perfect eternal life in the presence of God, where the former things have passed away, and all that remains is joy, peace, and the fullness of God's love. Number 3. The Glory of the New Jerusalem John describes a breathtaking vision of the New Jerusalem in Revelation, chapter 21, verses 10 to 11. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. The New Jerusalem isn't just an ordinary city, it is the glorious manifestation of God's presence, descending from heaven to earth. This vision of the holy city is more than a physical structure, it symbolizes the perfect eternal communion between God and His people, a place where heaven and earth fully unite. John's description of the New Jerusalem, shining with the glory of God, speaks to its divine nature. The brilliance of the city, like that of a precious jewel, signifies the pure, unblemished presence of God dwelling among His people. 
This radiance is not merely a reflection of physical light, but the very essence of God's glory filling the entire city. In Revelation chapter 21 verses 18 to 21, John continues to describe the magnificence of the new Jerusalem. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. The imagery of gold as pure as glass and gates made of a single pearl underscores the perfection and purity of the New Jerusalem. This city is not tainted by corruption or sin, it is a place of absolute holiness, where everything reflects the splendor of God. The New Jerusalem also represents the fulfillment of God's covenant with His people. In the Old Testament, Jerusalem was the center of worship, the place where the temple was built, and where God's presence was said to dwell. However, the earthly Jerusalem was subject to decay, destruction, and exile. The New Jerusalem, in contrast, is eternal, imperishable, and perfect. It is the ultimate realization of God's promise to restore His people and dwell among them forever. Isaiah chapter 60 verses 19 to 20 prophesies about this glorious future, saying, The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more, the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. This prophecy aligns with John's vision, where the city has no need for the sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates it. Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 to 24, further elaborates on this, stating, The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, is the source of this light, and His presence ensures that darkness, both literal and symbolic, is banished forever. The New Jerusalem is also a place of inclusivity, where the nations walk by its light, and the gates are never shut. Revelation chapter 21 verses 25 to 26. This symbolizes the open invitation to all who have accepted God's grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. It's a place where people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will gather in unity and worship. In this city there is no temple because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Revelation chapter 21 verse 22. This signifies that the entire city is filled with God's presence, making the need for a separate temple obsolete. The New Jerusalem itself becomes the Holy of Holies, where God's people have direct, unhindered access to Him at all times. The New Jerusalem is more than just a destination, it is the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise to restore and dwell with His people in a place of unimaginable beauty, purity, and glory. It's a place where the relationship between God and humanity is fully restored, where the effects of sin and death are forever eradicated, and where God's people will live in His glorious light for all eternity. Number 4. The River of Life and the Tree of Life John continues his vision in Revelation, chapter 22, verses 1-2, to describing a place of life and abundance. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. In this vivid imagery, John presents us with two powerful symbols, the river of life and the tree of life. Both are central to the vision of the New Jerusalem and represent the fullness of life and healing that believers will experience in heaven. The river of the water of life is a metaphor for the eternal, life-giving presence of God. The fact that it flows as clear as crystal signifies its purity, and its source, the throne of God and of the Lamb, highlights its divine origin. 
This river symbolizes the sustenance and vitality that come directly from God, offering unending refreshment and satisfaction to those who dwell in the New Jerusalem. The concept of a life-giving river is not new to the Bible. In Psalm chapter 46 verse 4, we read, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. This river represents God's presence, bringing joy and sustenance to His people. Similarly, in Ezekiel chapter 47 verses 1 to 12, the prophet describes a river flowing from the temple that brings life to everything it touches. This prophetic vision in Ezekiel closely parallels John's vision in Revelation, further emphasizing the theme of life and abundance that flows from God. The tree of life, which stands on each side of the river, is another profound symbol. This tree first appears in Genesis 2, 9, in the Garden of Eden, where it represented the eternal life that was available to Adam and Eve before the fall. However, after sin entered the world, access to the tree of life was barred to humanity, Genesis chapter 3 verses 22 to 24. But in the New Jerusalem, the tree of life is restored, signifying the full restoration of what was lost in Eden. John's description of the tree of life bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, emphasizes the continuous and abundant provision that will be available in heaven. The number twelve often symbolizes completeness and perfection in the Bible, indicating that the blessings of the tree of life will be perfect and eternal. The leaves of the tree, described as for the healing of the nations, suggests that in heaven, all divisions, conflicts, and sufferings that have plagued humanity will be healed. This healing is not merely physical, but also spiritual and relational, bringing about complete reconciliation and unity among all people. This theme of healing and restoration is echoed in Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 to 2, where God invites His people to come and drink freely of the water of life. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. The invitation to partake in the water of life is a reflection of God's desire to offer His people eternal satisfaction and healing. Jesus also spoke of this living water during His ministry. In John chapter 4, verse 14, He tells the Samaritan woman at the well, But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This promise of living water is fulfilled in the vision of the river of life in Revelation, where all who dwell in the New Jerusalem will experience the fullness of eternal life. Moreover, in John chapter 7, verse 38, Jesus declares, Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. This further underscores the idea that the life-giving presence of God will be fully realized in the New Jerusalem where believers will dwell in perpetual communion with Him. The river of life and the tree of life in the New Jerusalem are powerful images of the unending life, abundance, and healing that await those who trust in God. In this place, the curse of sin is completely broken and eternal life flows freely to all who dwell there. The restoration of the tree of life signifies that the separation between humanity and God has been fully healed and we will once again have access to the eternal life that was originally intended for us in the Garden of Eden. In this glorious future, there will be no more death, no more suffering, and no more separation from God. Instead, there will be eternal life, peace, and the fullness of God's presence, an existence where all who believe will find their ultimate fulfillment in Him. Number five, no more night. In heaven, there is no darkness, no night. Revelation chapter 22 verse 5 says, There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign for ever and ever. The imagery of no more night in heaven speaks to a profound transformation in the nature of existence. This isn't just about the absence of physical darkness, 
It's symbolic of the complete and eternal presence of God, who is the true source of all light. In heaven there will be no fear, no evil, no darkness, only the perpetual glorious light of God. Throughout the Bible, light is consistently used as a symbol of God's presence, purity and truth. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 we are told, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. The absence of darkness in heaven reflects the totality of God's presence. Where there is no room for sin, evil, or anything that causes fear or harm. The idea of God as light is further reinforced by Jesus himself in John chapter 8 verse 12, where he declares, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus, as the light of the world, illuminates the path to eternal life and ensures that those who follow him will never be overcome by darkness. In heaven, this promise is fully realized as God's light fills every aspect of existence. In the new creation, there is no need for artificial light or even the light of the sun, because God's glory will be all-encompassing. This concept is rooted in the Old Testament as well. In Isaiah chapter 60 verses 19 to 20, a prophecy speaks of this future reality. The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. This prophecy points to the eternal nature of God's light and the end of all sorrow and darkness. The absence of night in heaven also represents the end of all things associated with darkness, fear, uncertainty, and evil. In our current world, night often symbolizes danger and the unknown, but in heaven such fears will be a thing of the past. The eternal light of God banishes all that is harmful and brings perfect peace and security to his people. In Psalm chapter 36 verse 9, the psalmist writes, For with you is the fountain of life, in your light we see light. This verse highlights that true life and understanding come from God's light. In heaven, this light will not only illuminate our surroundings but also our hearts and minds, bringing perfect clarity, understanding and joy. Moreover, the promise that they will reign forever and ever, Revelation chapter 22 verse 5, signifies the eternal security and authority that God's people will enjoy in heaven. In this place of unending light, believers will share in the reign of Christ, free from the limitations and struggles of earthly life. This eternal reign reflects the fulfillment of God's original plan for humanity, where His people were meant to live in harmony with Him, exercising dominion over creation in righteousness and peace. This eternal light is also a reflection of God's unchanging nature. James Chapter 1 verse 17 tells us, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Unlike the shifting light and shadows of our world, God's light is constant, pure, and never fading. In heaven, this light will shine forever, unaltered by the passage of time or the changing of circumstances. The vision of no more night in heaven encapsulates the ultimate triumph of God's goodness over evil, of light over darkness. It assures us that in heaven we will live in the eternal unblemished presence of God, where His light will be our everlasting guide, comfort and joy. In this place there will be no more fear, no more uncertainty and no more separation from God only the eternal peace and security that come from dwelling in His glorious light. Number 6. A place prepared for you. Before Jesus left the earth, He made a promise to His followers in John, chapter 14, verses 2 to 3. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. These words of Jesus offer us one of the most comforting and hopeful assurances found in Scripture. Heaven isn't just a vague idea or a distant hope. It's a real place, 
meticulously prepared by Jesus himself for those who love him. This passage reveals the deeply personal and intimate nature of heaven. It's not just a place, but a homecoming, a place where you are meant to be, where you will be with him forever. When Jesus speaks of his Father's house, he is referring to heaven, but in a way that evokes a sense of family, belonging, and warmth. The image of a house with many rooms suggests that there is ample space for everyone who believes in him. It's a place of hospitality and welcome, where each person has a specific place prepared just for them. This personal preparation speaks to the care and love that Jesus has for his followers, ensuring that heaven is a place perfectly suited to each individual. The concept of a prepared place is further supported by the imagery in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, where it says, Instead they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This verse highlights that heaven is a better country, a city prepared by God himself, far surpassing anything we can imagine on earth. Jesus promised to come back and take you to be with me. John 14 verses 3 emphasizes the personal relationship he desires to have with each of his followers. This isn't just about a distant hope of being in a heavenly place, but about being with Jesus himself. The ultimate joy of heaven is not merely the beauty of the place, but the presence of Christ. As Paul expresses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Being at home with the Lord is the essence of heaven. The idea of Jesus preparing a place for us also ties back to the Old Testament, where God's desire to dwell with his people is a recurring theme. In Exodus chapter 15 verse 17, after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, they sang, You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance. The place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. This place God prepared for his people was a foreshadowing of the ultimate place Jesus is preparing in heaven, a sanctuary where believers will dwell with God forever. Moreover, in Psalm chapter 23, verse 6, David expresses the assurance of God's eternal care, saying, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This verse speaks to the eternal nature of the place God has prepared, a place of continual dwelling in His presence, marked by His goodness and love. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 3, we see the fulfillment of this promise. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. The prepared place that Jesus speaks of in John, chapter 14, is the very place where God will dwell among his people, a place of eternal communion and relationship. This promise of a prepared place should fill us with hope and anticipation. It assures us that heaven is not just a concept, but a real destination, a home where we will be fully known, fully loved, and fully alive in the presence of our Savior. It's the ultimate fulfillment of our deepest longings and the final answer to our heart's desire for a place of belonging and peace. Heaven, therefore, is not just a future hope, but a present reality being prepared by Jesus for those who love him. It's a place where we will be welcomed, where every sorrow and struggle of this life will be forgotten, and where we will experience the fullness of joy and peace in the presence of God. It's a homecoming a reunion with our Creator, and the beginning of an eternal life of perfect love and fellowship. Number 7. The Invitation to Heaven But heaven isn't just for anyone, it's for those who accept God's invitation. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, John writes, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. This verse represents one of the final and most important messages in the Bible, a universal invitation to partake in the eternal life that God offers. It's a call to every person, extending God's grace to all who are willing to receive it. But this invitation requires a response. Heaven is a gift, 
a free gift that God offers to everyone. Yet, like any gift, it must be accepted. The invitation is open to all who are willing to come, to those who are thirsty for the life that only God can give. The imagery of the water of life is significant. Water is essential for physical life, and in the same way, the water of life symbolizes the spiritual sustenance and eternal life that come from God alone. This metaphor is echoed throughout Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1, God extends a similar invitation. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Here, God invites those who are spiritually thirsty to come and receive what they cannot earn or buy, a gift freely given by His grace. Jesus Himself uses this imagery in His encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. In John chapter 4, verse 13, verse 14, He tells her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus offers the water of life, which satisfies the deepest longings of the soul and leads to eternal life. This offer is extended to all who believe in Him. The invitation in Revelation, chapter 22, verse 17, is not just a call to individuals, but a collective call from the Spirit and the Bride. The Spirit refers to the Holy Spirit who works in the hearts of people, drawing them to Christ. The Bride refers to the Church, which is the collective body of believers. Together they extend this invitation to the world, calling all to come and receive the gift of eternal life. This invitation also reflects the heart of God, who desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's desire is for all people to turn to Him and accept the invitation to eternal life. However, the choice to accept this invitation is up to each individual. Jesus makes it clear that not everyone will choose to accept the gift of eternal life. In Matthew, Chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The path to eternal life is open, but it requires a conscious decision to follow Christ and accept His invitation. The invitation to heaven is also a call to leave behind the things of this world that do not satisfy and to seek the eternal satisfaction that only God can provide. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, Jesus extends a tender invitation to all who are weary and burdened. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is an invitation to find true rest and peace in Christ, something that the world cannot offer. Finally, the invitation in Revelation, chapter 22, verse 17, underscores the urgency of the decision. The Bible speaks of the time when the invitation will no longer be available. In Matthew chapter 25 verses 10 to 13, Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins, where those who were ready went in with the bridegroom to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others came, saying, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, Jesus concludes, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This parable reminds us that the invitation is for a limited time and that we must be ready to accept it while the door is still open. Heaven is not just an abstract concept or a distant hope. It is a real, prepared place offered to us as a gift from God. But it's a gift that must be accepted. The invitation is clear and open to all who are willing to come, who are thirsty for the life that only God can give. It is the greatest offer ever made, the chance to spend eternity in the presence of God in a place of perfect peace, joy, and love. The question is, will you accept this invitation?
As we conclude the truth about heaven, so what is heaven according to the Bible? It's not just a place in the clouds or a distant dream. It's a new heaven and a new earth where God himself will dwell with his people. It's a place of unimaginable beauty, free from pain and sorrow, filled with life, light, and the very presence of God. And it's a place prepared specifically for you if you choose to accept God's invitation. John's revelation of heaven isn't just a story, it's a promise, a promise that can be yours, a promise of eternal life in the presence of the one who loves you beyond measure. If you found this message inspiring, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more insights into the Bible. And remember, heaven is closer than you think. It's a gift waiting for you.